Welcome to today's edition of Just As They Speak, an academic initiative by the School of Law at Sapshur University for the Nani Palkiwala Centenary Celebration. I take the utmost honor to extend my sincere and hearty welcome to Justice Sri N. Kumar, former judge of the Karnataka High Court, for the second part of his talk on the comparative laws of succession. We are indeed privileged to have you today with us, sir. And now over to you for today's lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning to everyone. In the last edition, we saw the source of the Hindu law, the Muslim law, as well as the law applicable to Christians, Parsis, and Jews in this country. Now, insofar as Hindu law is concerned, as on today, now it is completely codified. There is nothing like personal law left anymore. Insofar as Muslims are concerned, they are still governed by their personal law, which is known as Sharia. Insofar as Christian, Jews, and Parsis are concerned, today they are governed by the Indian Succession Act of 1925. So today, let us see what is the law of succession which governs these communities in this country? And what is the difference? And how far these laws are consistent with the provisions of the Indian constitution? Now, coming to the Hindu law, as we discussed earlier, to start with, women had no right in the property at all. Her right was only to have a right of maintenance, right of residence, and an unmarried daughter, the expenses for marriage. In Mysore in 1933, by the Hindu Women's Right to Property Act of 1933, an attempt was made to give some right to a woman. But that was known as a woman's estate and a limited estate. But in 1937, the Britishers, on an all-India basis, passed the Women's Right to Property Act of 1937, where a widow was given the rights of her husband. That is, if a husband dies, though he is a compassionate or a member of a joint family, the widow stepped into the shoes of her husband, and all that her husband would have got in the compassionate property or family property, she was also entitled to. But again, it was a limited estate. Restrictions were there on her to alienate the property. And on her death, the property would go by survivorship to the brothers of the deceased husband. So it is in this background after the independence in 1956, the Hindu Succession Act of 1956 was enacted by the Indian Parliament. First time recognizing the right of an Indian woman, Hindu woman, to property. Probably there was stiff opposition from the orthodox Hindus and therefore they could not pass a law which placed the women on equal footing with the men. Therefore, as a via media, they made a compromise. What is that compromise? They said, insofar as the property of a father and mother is concerned, that is their self-acquired property. There can't be any difference between the son and the daughter. Both got equal share. Insofar as the compassionate property is concerned, the earlier section 6 made it very clear. If a compassionate dies before partition, his share in the compassionate devolves upon the other members of the compassionary by way of survivorship and not under the act. But a proviso was added to that saying, if that person dies leaving behind a female heir, then his share is to be carved out and that share is to be distributed in accordance with this act and not by survivorship. So that was the basic difference which was brought about in the Hindu Succession Act, 1956. 
Now, before we go into the shares, you know, in India, though we are all called Hindus, we have our own uh, backlog. Each one wants to claim he belongs to this community, that this religion, that religion. Therefore, it was not that easy for the parliament to define who is a Hindu because it was a Hindu succession act. It is understandable who is a Muslim, who is a Christian, who is a Jew, who is a Parsi. But among Hindus, who is a Hindu? Whom this act was passed? Who are the persons who are governed by the Shastric law, the personal law, prior to this enactment? Therefore, this assumes greater importance in the present day context where you, one, you find wonderful interpretations of the word Hindu without knowing its real meaning. So therefore, let us go by what the parliament said in 1956. They said, this act, this act applies to a Hindu. Who is a Hindu? Any person, this act applies to any person who is a Hindu by religion, who is a Hindu by religion in any of its forums, in any of its forums or developments, including, you know, the inclusive definition, including Veera Shaiva, a Lingayit, or a follower of Brahmo Samaj, Pratana Samaj, and Ari Samaj. It only shows the Hindu religion is the basic religion. It had its offshoots in the form of Veera Shaiva, Lingayit, Brahma Samaj, Pratana Samaj, and Ari Samaj. So, by this definition of Hindu, the parliament made it clear all these persons form part of the Hindu religion, and to them, this act is applicable. It did not end there. We look into the past for centuries. From the Hindus arose this Buddhist religion, Jains and Sikhs, everything has a historical background. So now this law made it very clear. Hindu is a person who is a Buddhist a Jaina or Sikh by religion. You can have whatever religious practices you want. Basically, you are a Hindu and this Hindu succession act equally applies to Buddhists, Jains and Sikhs. As I said, India is a wonderful country. Nobody knows who is who. Therefore, they introduced one omnibus definition. What is the definition? To any other person who is not a Muslim. Earlier, they said positively who is a Hindu. Now they are saying, who is not a Muslim, a Christian, a Parsi, or a Jew by religion, unless it is proved that any such person would have been governed by Hindu law or by any custom or usage as part of that law in respect to any of the matters dealt with herein if this act had not been passed. Therefore, it is an exhaustive definition. No one is left out. A comprehensive definition defining who is a Hindu and to whom this act applies. An explanation was also added because we have what is called as inter-caste marriages. Husband may be a Hindu, wife may be a Sikh, a Jain, and also a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian. The explanation made it very clear. To whoever it is born, find out the circumstances, the background where the child was brought up, and that would be the religion of the child. So therefore, exhaustively, while passing the Hindu Succession Act, the parliament understood the complexity of the problem, and they have done their best to define who is a Hindu. And therefore, today, we cannot have any doubt in our mind to whom this Hindu Succession Act applies. It does not apply to Muslims. It does not apply to Christians. It does not apply to a Jew. It does not apply to a Parsi. The rest of the population of this country are governed by this Hindu succession act. Of course, in the act, they have also defined certain definitions which are extensively referred to in the act. Who is an agnate? Who is a cognate? Who is a full blood, half blood, in blood? And then who is an heir? And also, what do you mean by interstate? Because Hindu law, Shastric law, did not recognize testamentary succession. It is something which we got it from the Britishers after they came here. Now, basically, Hindu succession is a case of interstate succession. 
And therefore, they define what do you mean by interstate? You know, that is the basic thing. They said interstate means a person is deemed to die in day, interstate in respect to the property of which he or she has, made, has not made a testamentary disposition capable of taking effect. If he has not made any will, then in the case of interstate succession, then the rules embodied in this enactment are applicable to such Hindus insofar as succession to property is concerned. This act also made it very clear as the Hindu Succession Act did not cover the whole gamut of Hindu law. Still, they were following the Shastrik law. What they said was in section four, wherever there's an inconsistency between the text of Hindu law, custom or usage of Hindu law with this act, this act would provide. So the act was given an overriding effect against the Shastrik law, the custom and usage practiced by Hindus. And secondly, as I said, there were several laws which were in force prior to the coming into force of the Hindu Succession Act. They made it very clear if there's any inconsistency between the earlier law governing Hindus and the Succession Act, then Succession Act overrides the earlier forms. Because we had what is called a limited estate, we had called as uh, women's estate, there were discrimination. Now, all that have been, have been removed under the present act, and therefore this act overrides the provisions of those acts, even though in some other aspects, those acts continue to apply. Then, <clears throat> they also made it very clear, this act is not applicable to the succession which is regulated by Indian Succession Act of 1925, and also the Special Marriage Act. And some other exceptions have been carved out under Section 5. Now, the main section which dealt with this between the self-acquired property of a father and the corporationary property is contained in Section 9, the Old Act. Section 6, Old Act. It said, where a male Hindu dies after the commencement of this Act, having at the time of his death an interest in mitokshara corporationary property, his interest in the property shall devolve by survivorship upon the surviving members of the corporationary and not in accordance with this act. It is this provision which made discrimination between a son and a daughter. This is a provision which made discrimination between male and female among the Hindus. But it was retained. <clears throat> but a proviso was that <clears throat> as a compromise. It said, if the deceased had left him surviving a female relative specified in class one of the schedule or a male relative specified in the class who claims through such female relative, the interest of the deceased in the Mitokshara proportionally property shall devolve by testamentary or interstate succession as the case may be under this act and not by survey. So if a deceased compassionate dies leaving a female member, then succession is under this act and not by survivorship. Then the question was, when there was no partition on the date of his death, how are you going to determine his share? Because it was well settled. In the case of a compassionary property, nobody can predicate what the exact share of a particular compassionate is. It is fluctuating in nature. If a male son is born, the shares of others get reduced. If a person dies, the other shares get increased. That is what meant by fluctuation. So keeping that in mind, explanation was added. What they said was, for the purpose of this section, the interstate interest of a Hindu Mitakshara Kopashana shall be deemed to be the share in the property that would have been allotted to him if a partition of the property had taken Sir, I kindly request you to unmute.
Yes. Yes. If a partition of the property had taken place immediately before his death, irrespective of whether he was entitled to claim partition or not, a notional partition had to be effected prior to his death. If prior to his death a partition had been taken place, his share would have been known. So therefore, even if he is not dead, effective partition, notional partition, and that share will devolve on his legal heirs under this act. Here, one catch was, Kopashana's sons got a right by birth, and therefore, in the Kopashanary property, they had a share equal to that of their father. Now, at a partition, father got one share, sons also got equal share. But in the father's share, again, partition is affected, giving equal share to all members mentioned in Schedule 1. Therefore, the sons got an equal share as co-partioners and a share out of the father's share as under this act. So therefore, discrimination continued between the son and the daughter. So therefore, this was the position. This was unacceptable because out of the constitution, Article 14 said there can't be any discrimination on the ground of sex. But country recognized that personal law should provide. Because of the concession made by this community, the parliament was able to make an inroad into the personal law. And to this extent, the Shastrik law, the text, the custom were overrided. Now, after giving this, the section 8 is the most important section, which gives you an indication of how the property devolves on the children of a male dying intestate. The property of a male Hindu dying intestate shall devolve according to the provisions of this chapter. That is, not by survivorship, but according to the provisions of this chapter. Now, this section made it very clear. The property divorce firstly upon the heirs, being the relatives specified in class one of the schedule. Class one of the schedule. Who are the persons who are in class one? Please see it. The son, the daughter, the widow, mother, and sons and daughters of the deceased son or daughter. I would say it's the most scientific way of distributing the property, which you will not find in under Mohammedan law or even under the Indian Succession Act. Now, these class one is take the property equally. No difference between the mother, the uh, wife, son and daughter, no difference. Everyone will get an equal right. Only if there is no class one heir, then upon the heirs, being the relatives specified in class two of the schedule, who are the class two schedules? Father, son's daughter's son, Son's daughter's daughter, brother, sister, thirdly, daughter's son's son, then fourth, father's father, father's widow, father's mother, all distant relatives. They constitute it. Here, one branch excludes the other. They don't take it equally. If the first category of persons are there, the other category doesn't get it. So therefore, thirdly, if there is no heir of any of the two classes, then upon the agnes of the deceased and then upon the agnes and the cognates and agnes of the deceased. So I would say this distribution of property made under the Hindu succession act is more scientific, just and in conformity with the constitutional provisions. So therefore, <clears throat> though late in 1956, when the parliament enacted this law, I think they have done a great justice to the Hindus in the matter of distribution of the properties, probably taking into consideration the inequality which is there in the other 
to loss. Now, the most important provision in this act is section 14. That only shows the concern of the parliament to women to do gender justice. Today we are talking about gender justice. It is found in section 14. You know, as on the date of Hindu Succession Act, we had what is called the women's estate. It was a limited estate. She can't alienate the property. After her death, that property goes back to the male members. This was not acceptable after this act came into force. Now, section 14 makes it very clear. The property of a female Hindu to be her absolute property. What was a limited estate became an absolute estate. No discrimination. The estate of a man was absolute. Estate of a woman was limited. Now by this section, in one stroke, they said women's estate also becomes the absolute estate here afterwards. Now, please see the section. It makes a very interesting reading. Any property possessed, the word possessed has been now interpreted by the Supreme Court saying, for this action to apply, that lady must be in physical possession of the property or she must be getting the usufruct of the property. She must be in law, in possession of the property. Any property possessed by a female Hindu, whether acquired before or after the commencement of this act, shall be held by her as full owner thereof and not as a limited owner. So conversion of limited ownership into full ownership. The limited ownership blossomed into a full ownership. Now, when they said about property, they have made it very clear. What are the properties which are covered under this? An explanation was added. In this subsection, property includes both mobile and immobile property acquired by a female Hindu by inheritance or device at a partition or in lieu of maintenance or arrears of maintenance, or by gift from any person, whether a relative or not, before, at or after the marriage, or by her own skill exertion, or by purchase, or by prescription, or in any manner whatsoever, and also any such property held by her as Tridana immediately before the commencement of this act. So all these properties, if she had a limited estate, that limited estate blossomed into an absolute estate and she became the absolute owner of the property and she was entitled to deal with the property in the manner she likes, without any limitations, without any restrictions. So that is the section 14 is a very important provision in the Succession Act, which restored the equal status of women as far as holding the property is concerned. But there was a caveat that is contained in subsection 2. Nothing contained in subsection 1 shall apply to any property acquired by way of gift. That is, if a father is giving a property by way of a gift with life interest and then the property goes to grandchildren or under a will, similar clauses, or any other instrument, maybe a settlement deed, or under a decree or order of a civil court, or under an award where the terms of the gift, will or other instrument, or the decree, order or award, prescribe a restrict, restricted estate in such property. That is, if the law said it is a limited estate, now the law is saying that limited estate became absolute estate. If by inter vivos, her right to property is restricted, then it is not a question of discrimination. She was only given that much right. The person who was giving the right gave only that much right. That right did not enlarge into an absolute right. So therefore, section 8 and 14 made a historical difference insofar as the rights of women in the Hindu society is concerned. Then, earlier there was what is called as the Sridhana property and uh, she had her own right and probably the women, the daughters had little more rights, preferential rights than the son. I have taken cons into consideration that 
in section 15 of this act. Now, they have dealt with what is called as general rules of succession in the case of female Hindus. They said the property of a female Hindu dying intestate shall devolve according to the rules set out in section 16. They said, firstly upon the sons and daughters, including the children of any pretty son or daughter and the husband. So, son, daughter, if they are not there, the children and the husband, they are on equal par. Secondly, upon the heirs, the husband. Thirdly, upon the mother and father. Fourthly, upon. So, one excludes the other. So, that is understandable. But what is more important to be seen, especially in the present day context is, we are talking about uh, uh, what you call as dowry deaths and deaths for the sake of property and Indian penal code was amended saying first seven years they die, there's a presumption. You find an interesting provision in this section. Read this. Sex, subsection 2. Notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1, any property inherited by a female Hindu from her father or mother shall devolve in the absence of any son or daughter of a deceased, not upon the other heirs referred to in subsection 1, in the order specified therein, but upon the heirs of the father. I think an attempt was made to protect the girl, the wife. If there are no children, she has got the property from her father and mother, then the husband gets no right. Property goes back to the family of her parents. Similarly, if the property has come from husband's side, again, the property will go back to the husband's side. To see that no mischief is played, especially in a society of ours, where you have all sorts of practices uh, is there. So therefore, a very thought provision was introduced protecting the interest of the woman. So apart from this, what is of importance is this. As I said earlier, the daughters were not given the equal share with the sons. In 1990, the state of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala was not prepared to accept this discrimination between daughter and sons. They came up with an amendment to the old section 6, which found the presidential assent in 1994 and it became a law. So what did they do? An attempt was made to give the status of a compassionate to a daughter for the first time. But though status of a daughter was given, there were some reservations. What is the reservation? A son, a compassioner, gets a right by birth. Now right by birth is given to the daughter. But he also has a right to file a suit for partition. That right was not given to the daughter. Though she was given the status of a compassioner, that right was not given. At a partition, she was entitled to an equal share. If there is no partition, she has no share. The second drawback with that amendment was, if a daughter is married, she ceases to be the member of a joint family of her parents, she becomes the member of a joint family of her husband, then they said, as on the day the law came into force, if she is married, she can't be the co -partioner. So, this co right became a marriage as far as she is concerned. The third and the most important thing is, if there was a partition in the family, then also she is not entitled to a share. So, what more is required for men to deprive the daughter? And if you look into the background of the present amendment, they said in Tamil Nadu especially, lakhs of stamp papers were purchased. For what? To effect a partition and antedate it. Because the law of partition is very clear. A partition can be oral. It need not be in writing. It is not, need not be by a registered instrument. 
there could be a polopathy that is make a list of properties that itself is a proof of partition or record a partition subsequently that itself is a partition and it doesn't require stamp duty and registration and therefore though with the best of intention the law was made the daughter could not get her legitimate share because of these manipulations the purpose was defeated it is in that context the parliament looked into it found out how the society is moving and then they came up with this present section 6 which substituted the old section so you have to understand this new section in that context and i am sure the members of the bar who are practicing have been seeing for the last 15 years how the supreme court is struggling to grapple with this problem and put a correct interpretation of the section which I, in my view is a very simple section there is no confusion confusion is in your mind not in the confusion in the section and that only shows the orthodox among the men among hindus they are not prepared to accept the parliament has accepted it parliament has passed the law parliament has treated the daughter as equal to son but judges struggle they are find it difficult to accept now let us see this amended section which is a subject matter of interpretation by several benches of the supreme court and i think the last of the judgment has put at rest many of these controversies on and from the commencement of the hindu succession act 2005 this itself is a interpretation in a joint hindu family governed by mitakshara law that is it does not apply to daibaga the daughter of a copashana the daughter of a copashana was given what right see the simple english language the daughter of a copashana by birth that means on the day the act was passed she must have been born not she should be born after that by birth become a copashana in her own right mark this right in her own right her right is not dependent on the father as the right of a son is not dependent on the father daughter's right is also not dependent on the father in her own right in the same manner as the son if any doubt is there this clarify in the same manner as the son find out what is the right of a son give that right to the daughter that's all the amendment see the controversy see the number of judgments by birth a copashanar gets a right by birth therefore a daughter is also gets a right by birth become a copashanar in her own right in the same manner as the son so this is the right conferred in so the property is concerned what is the right have the same rights in the copashanari property as she would have had if she had been a son you can't think of a simple language thing what is the right of the daughter in the property find out what is the right of the son whatever right the son has given give it to the daughter where is the confusion unless you refuse to give it unless you refuse to recognize it then this interpretation interpretation is not required at all the language employed is simple the golden rule of interpretation says give the value, the meaning to be attached to that don't try to interpret don't show your intelligence that's precisely what we are doing we judges are doing our intelligence without reading the section as it is then under hindu law there is what is called as a pious obligation a daughter cannot be given only the property without obligations liabilities they said be subject to the same liabilities in respect to the said corporation property at that profession whatever liability son takes you also should take because whatever is the property the son gets you are also getting and any reference to a hindu bitakshara of corporationer should be deemed to include a reference to a daughter of a corporationer so corporationery was an exclusive club of males women daughter female had no place now by this amendment a daughter is becoming a member of a corporationery that's precisely and then whatever right the son gets the daughter also gets but this amendment was brought in 2005 act is of 1956 and you are giving a right by birth what should happen to transactions which have taken place for 50 years if third party interests have come in what should be happen parliament was fully conscious of that see what they said they added a proviso what is that 
nothing contained in subsection shall affect or invalidate any disposition or alienation including any partition or testamentary disposition of property which had taken place before the 20th december 2004 they set a deadline if property has been alienated in a manner known to law before 20th of december 2004 this amendment is not applicable daughter gets no right fair enough third party interest is not affected and there can't be any hard word this is the object no you saw the judgments of the supreme court for her to get her father should be there this and that and all anyhow luckily uh, supreme court has uh, corrected the errors committed in the last 10 years and today i think we can breathe have a peace of mind that they at least at last the supreme court has interpreted this section keeping in mind the object which is the parliament has enacted it when the parliament want to give right to the daughters the courts have no business to take it and nothing has happened it's just now this provision is in conformity with article 14 of the constitution no discrimination on the ground of sex at last even though the constitution came into force in 1950 at least in 2005 we have brought this law of succession in conformity with the constitutional provisions constitutional goal of achieving equality i think for that pur- purpose it that should be sufficient but there is a area of again a controversy what do you mean by a partition a partition under hindu law can be over palupatti that law continues but subsection 5 of the section said nothing contained in this section shall apply to a partition which has been affected before the 20th day of december 2004 they said this law is not applicable if a partition has taken place before 20th day of december no difficulty the question is what is that partition then an explanation is asked that is the subject matter of interpretation for the purpose of this section section 6 as amended partition means any partition made by execution of a deed of partition duly registered under the registration act if there is a oral partition the section applies you have to give a share if there is a palupatti if there is a memorandum no you can't deny the daughter the share partition means for the purpose of this section by a registered instrument of partition affected before 28 december 2004 there could be a partition by a decree of the court also therefore they said for this section partition affected by a decree of the court what do you mean by a partition affected by a decree of the court suit of partition is filed a preliminary decree is passed appeal second appeal supreme court then you have final application final decree again decree is passed appeal second appeal supreme court then execution only in the execution side when the bailiff goes to the place and hands over the property you can say partition is affected if a partition has been affected in such manner then this amendment doesn't apply otherwise it applies that means it applies to all pending proceedings whether in the preliminary decree final decree even in the execution so exhaust for the latest supreme court judge made makes little uh, alteration to this statutory problem they say though the law says it should be a registered instrument but without a registered partition has taken place and that partition is acted upon and that partition has been reflected in governmental authorities public documents in a given case a discretion is given to the court to accept that partition beyond that unless it is by a registered instrument you cannot deny the daughter a share in the corporation in property if partition has taken place after this particular day so now this is broadly the law okay. then another aspect which you have to 
bear in mind as far as the Hindu society is concerned. Bigamy is prohibited in Indian law. You look at the Hindu Marriage Act. If a spouse living, you can't marry. And even if you marry, there's a void marriages. Necessity knows no law. That is the law. People go on marrying. So children are born. The object is to prevent bigamy. And when that is not possible, when the child is born, the child is innocent. You can penalize the girl. This is the problem with the society faced. Then question is, what is the right of that child born to avoid and void marriages? Broadly, it's called as an illegitimate child. Child born to a valid marriage, they are legitimate. The child born to a void marriage, it is illegitimate. This is what we are calling. The children are innocent in this. Now the parliament went on step forward and said, you cannot make these children suffer because of the folly of their parents. You cannot deny them their property rights. Therefore, they did not introduce any provision in the Hindu Succession, Hindu Succession Act. They introduced a provision in the Indian Marriage Act as Section 16. That is, the object of that is legitimacy of children of void and voidable marriages. And there they dealt with this aspect of succession. They said, notwithstanding that the marriage is null and void under Section 11, any child of such marriage who would have been legitimate if the marriage had been valid, shall be legitimate whether such child is born before or after the commencement of the marriage laws and whether or not a decree of nullity is granted in respect to the marriage under this act and whether or not the marriage is held to be void otherwise than on a petition under this act. Now, once such a marriage is there and a child is born, as far as the property rights are concerned, subsection 3 made it very clear. Nothing contained in subsection 1 or subsection 2 shall be construed as conferring upon any child of a marriage which is null and void or which is annulled by a decree of nullity under section 12 any rights in or to the property of any person other than the parents in any case where but for the passing of this act such child would have been incapable of possessing or acquiring any such rights by reason of his not being the legitimate child of his parents. So that illegitimate right was not given a right in the co-partial property. She was not given a right in the Hindu joint Hindu family property. But the child was given a right in the property of the father and mother. In the property of the father and mother, under section 8 of this act, the sons and daughters and others get equal right. Likewise, the sons who are legitimate, sons who are illegitimate, all of them are given equal rights by virtue of this provision under this act, under the marriage act. And therefore, when we are talking about succession, in the property of the father and the mother, even the illegitimate right has equal share as that of the legitimate. But illegitimate children are not co -partioners. Illegitimate children cannot file a suit for partition during the life of their father as a legitimate son can file. To that extent, the difference continues. But in all other aspects, this so-called illegitimacy is wiped out. Now, this is broadly the law governing the Hindus. For want of time, let me stop here because we have to deal with the other uh, laws also. So, I would say, as on today, the law of succession governing the Hindus is most scientific, most advanced. We started from a place where men and women are not treated equal. Today, absolutely there is no difference. They are equal. It is in conformity with Article 14 of the Constitution. Now, coming to the Mohammedan law, there is no codified law. They oppose a codification. They are still governed by their personal law. Then the question would be, as in the case of a Hindu, who is a Mohammedan? At least, Hindu Succession Act defines who is a Hindu. But nonetheless, who is a Mohammedan is well understood. A person who professes, a person who professes the Mohammedan religion, that is, who acknowledges that he is but one, but there is one but one God, and that Muhammad is the prophet. He is a Muhammad. 
This is all the requirement of to become a Mahat. If you accept that there is one God, and if you accept Muhammad is the Prophet, then whatever he follows is immaterial. He is a Mahamadan, and his right to succession is governed by the Mahamadan God. Now, as you said already, they define what is called as the heritable property. All the property left by a Mahamadan is not heritable property, in which you can't work out a share. So, to arrive at a heritable property, certain rules have been prescribed. When a Mahamadan dies, leaving a property, leaving an estate, first out of the estate, you have to pay funeral and burial expenses. Second, you have to pay the debts of the deceased. And then, if he has made a will, one third of the property goes under the will. And then the remaining things is called a heritable property, which is inherited. No law difference, no, no distinction made between movable and immovable property, and that is a heritable property. As compared to Hindu law, the Muslim law does not recognize what is known as right by birth. The right to property arises only on the death of the Muslim. Now there is a wonderful concept called principles of representation. Under Hindu law, class 1 is, if the son is not alive, his children will get it. Daughter is not alive, his son will get it. But in Hindu law, Mohammedan law makes a difference. What is that? According to the Mohammedan law, the principle of representation has more than one meaning. It may be applied for the purpose of deciding what persons are entitled to inherit and the quantum of the share of any person, given person on the footing that is entitled to inherit. When a father is alive, if he has three sons, one son dies before the father, and if that son has two sons, after the death of the father, the two Living sons get the entire property and these grandsons are excluded. That is the Mahamadan. That's the difference between Hindu law. Then, when the father is alive, when the father is dead, the son is alive. But partition is not affected. Partition is affected after the death of the son then his children get a right. There is something peculiar to Muhammad. They call it as law of representation. Of course, there are some differences between Shias and Muslims, but broadly, this is the law that is called the Western inheritance. Now, coming to the joint family, because all the Muslims in India are all converts. Before conversion, you are a member of a joint family. You had a family business. All of you were living together, earning together, enjoying together, acquiring properties. But Mohammedan law do not recognize the concept of joint family or joint family business. But it has been held in some cases. If during the continuance of the family, properties are acquired in the name of the managing member of the family, and if it is proved that they are possessed by all the members jointly, the presumption is that they are the properties of the family and not the separate property of the member in whose name they stand. Though law as such doesn't recognize this. In the facts of that particular case, this concept is recognized in some cases. Similarly, if the father was carrying on a business and he dies, and that business is being carried on by the children, there is a semblance of what we call a joint family business, which is recognized in Hindu law and in Mohammedan law also, they do recognize such things. Now, coming to the inheritance, which is the most important. The Mohammedan law classifies the heirs into three classes. One, sharers, two, residuaries, and three, distant kingdom. Who are the sharers? Sharers are those who are entitled to a prescribed share of inheritance. Prescribed share. In Hindu law, equal. Here it is prescribed. Residuaries are those who take no prescribed share. They have no prescribed share. But succeed to the residue. After the prescribed share is given to the sharers, 
when something remains a residue and persons who are entitled to the residue are called as residuaries. When the sharers and residuaries are not there, the property is left, it goes to the distant relatives, they are called as distant hinder. So, the Mohammedan law, especially the Sunni law, recognizes these three types of sharers. Shia law does not recognize this distant kinder. They only confine it to sharers and residuaries. Now, the peculiarity of Mohammedan law is, please see, who are the sharers? The sharers are those who are entitled to certain share in the deceased property. They are 12 in number. In Hindu law, the man dies, mother, wife, children. Even the father doesn't get it. Here you see, husband, wife, daughter, daughter of a son, father, paternal grandfather, mother, grandmother on a male line, full sister, consanguine sister, uterine sister, uterine brother. Twelve people are recognized as sharers. So, if you want to find out what is the share, like Hindu law, you can't just do it like that. In the Mohammedan law book, you have a table of sharers. And table of sharers for Sunni law is different from the Mohammedan law. They must be, first, you have to find out who is whether the person involved is a Sunni or a Shia. In India, all are governed by Sunni law. If anybody says, I am a Shia, he has to prove it. The burden shifts on him to show that he is a Shia. Otherwise, everybody is Sunni. Now, when we talk about uh, this table, you will see father share is one sixth. Then the grandfather share is another one sixth. Husband is one fourth. Wife is one eighth. Others are one sixth. Uterine mother is one sixth. Daughter is one third. Like these shares are there. Though there are 12 sharers, if somebody is not there, then the share gets differentiated. So therefore, it is impossible to say what is the share of a Hindu in a Muslim. You have to keep this table, then find out the relative, then find out who are the sharers, and then you have to determine it. Very complex. Any of them have been doing it. It's only the headache of people who have to calculate it in course. Otherwise, probably people knew it. So therefore, under Mohammedan law, from the beginning, there was no denial of a share to a woman. To that extent, it is great. Though there is no denial of a share to a woman, woman was not given equal share. The daughter, the wife, are entitled to half the share of the son. That discrimination is there from the beginning. Even today, it continues. And that is violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. Even today, the share given to a Muslim woman under the personal law does not in conformity with the constitutional goal of treating man and woman, son and daughter, equal. That is, discrimination persists on the ground of sex. There is another interesting concept in Mahodan law. The distribution of property is per capita and per strip. Now, insofar as Sunni law is concerned, the property is divided by per capita. So what do you mean by per strip in Shia law? If there's a father, two sons, one son has three, daughter, uh, three sons, another son has two sons. If all of them die, three grandsons and two sons, five, one-fifth, is called per capita. But in Shia law, per strike, find out the origin. Make it half, half is taken by two, and half is taken by two. So that's how this difference in per strip and per capita continues in Mohammedan law. As I said, there is nothing like a right by birth under Mohammedan law. Now, as far as the Shia is concerned, though they call it as the sharers and residuaries and kindred, they call it as A is by consanity, that is by blood relationships. And the other is by marriage, that is husband and wife. The other is by blood relationship. And again, 
they have a particular table. So you have to keep the table, find out what the specific share is, and if somebody is not there, the share goes on varying, and that's how it is to be calculated. Even here also, the daughter is not given equal share, so that woman is not given equal share to that of man. That discrimination continues. This is about the Mohammedan law. So now the difference between the Hindu law and the Mohammedan law is that though Hindus discriminated women, today there is no discrimination under Hindu law between man and woman, son and daughter. Though from the inception in Mohammedan law, woman was given a right, widow was given a right, daughter was given a right, wife was given a right, but today they are not equal, they are unequal. And it is hit by Article 14 of the Constitution. Now coming to the Christians, the Hindu, Hindu Indian Succession Act of 1925. They also have some peculiarities. It is not that easy as Hindu law is concerned. Now section, chapter two of the Indian Succession Act talks about interstates, rules in case of interstates other than parcels. 32 says, property of an interstate devolves upon the wife or husband or upon those who are kindred of the deceased in the order and according to the rules here and after contained in this chapter. There are 20 sections. You have to read every section and find out which section applies. The reason is this. Please see, I'll give you one small example. Read the section 33. Where interstate has left a widow and lineal descendant, that is the sons and daughters, or widow and a kindred only, or widow and no kinder. They are the three types. Where the interest has left widow, if he has left, also left in a lineal descendants, one third of his property shall belong to the widow. She gets only one third. And the remaining two thirds go to the lineal descendants. If he has left no lineal descendants, but has left persons who are of kinder to him, then as against one third, half of the property will go to the widow and the remaining half is to be distributed among the kinder. If he has left none who are kindred to him, the whole of the property shall belong to him. So therefore, it is not a case of equal right. The, the quantum of share to which a person is entitled to under the Indian succession act depends upon who is alive, who is dead, and how they are related. Therefore, here there is no table. Like Hindu law, there is no general rule. You have to take out this section, find out your case falls under this. And a specific section is provided under the Indian Succession Act saying what share a person is entitled to when somebody is alive and somebody is dead. Of course, the, the Indian Succession Act is better known for testamentary succession. Under Hindu law, there was no testamentary succession. When Britishers came, they made an act. And of course, now Section 30 of the Hindu Succession Act deals with testamentary succession. Mohammedan law recognizes testamentary succession that is with a limitation that more than one third, they cannot give it. And as far as Indian Succession Act is concerned, that is the law which deals with testamentary succession. So, testamentary succession, proof of testamentary succession, and is an exhaustive law, grant of probate, administration. Of course, the section says, that, that provision is not applicable to Hindus and Muslims if they are living in a particular area. So broadly speaking, in India today, we do not have a common civil court. There is a discrimination in the matter of succession based on the religion. We call it as a secular country, but in practice, it is a country where everyone, the civil rights, secular rights, Right to property is a secular right. It is nothing to do with religion. So that discrimination continues. And everybody were pouncing upon the Hindu law saying, yo, woman has no right. The woman has no place. Well, it was so, but I think they are the most advanced today. And absolutely there is no discrimination between man and woman, son and daughter under Hindu law. But under Mohammedan law, Though right is recognized in the women, equal rights is not given. That's what the Indian succession happened. Their right is dependent upon who is alive, who is dead, and what is the share. By and large, 
in a country which has shelter so many religions well rooted and for a man it is the marriage and the property which is about most everybody is only worried about that from morning to evening yes we have a rule of law where without much difficulty this particular problem of succession is dealt with it would be better if we have a common civil code because whatever the religion you follow all of us are basically the residents of this great country and there should not be any discrimination between man and woman a son and a daughter so i will stop here let me have some questions because i stole i should stop it in one hour and receive any questions and possible answer them thank you so much sir for such an enlightening talk was really helpful to know the depth and intricacies involved in the subject uh, it was a great privilege to have you with us and to listen to your enhancing remarks before we wind up sir there is just one question from uh, anirudh kumar third year bcom llb from school of law sir and if i may read it out to you yes sir the question is in general if mohammedan law does not consider the concept of joint family or joint family business how can the courts take a view if that is valid shouldn't there be a partition in such circumstances mohammedan law do not recognize the concept of joint family and joint family business that's the law but you must know basically the mohammedans and especially recently if they are converted they were all members of joint family there is nothing wrong in that principle if four brothers are living together working together and giving respect to the elder in the family purchase the property in his name because he was like a fatherly figure though this concept of hindu law is not applicable to them the underlying principle that this is a property acquired out of the joint efforts of all the persons continues that's why i said in the facts of that particular case you read that book uh, mula mamana law by hidayatullah there are two one one paragraph they say though it is not applicable in a given set of facts if the evidence is produced that though the property stands in the name of one person the consideration for that acquisition flowed from the efforts of others courts have applied and given relief to the persons who are entitled Thank you sir thank you so much for taking the question and once again i extend my sincere gratitude for you sir for your valuable presence and your significant contribution in imparting valuable knowledge to all of us to us young and aspiring lawyers thank you sir thank you so much thank you namaste thank you.